Good morning, everybody. Today we're here to review all of the July 2023 releases for all of the applications. Please feel free to ask questions by unmuting yourself and speaking up or just sending us a chat in the, in the chat window. So let's start on the wiki. Down below under meetings and trainings. This is where you registered and you can find the recording later. But down below is the release caps for both years, 2022 and 2023. And we're gonna review July. And so this page includes all of the releases that we'll be covering. I'm kind of stalling because other people are still joining. All right, so USAS had three regular releases in the month of July and one hot fix. The one uh, bug was thrown an error when the user had an account filter attached to them, even when the account filter was not being chosen on the report. So for example, if I looked at a user, Paul, he had an account filter on him. So when he went to generate any of the canned reports, you can see that he has an account filter on him. But prior to this bug being fixed, when he ran any of the canned reports here and still did not choose, he would have to be logged in as Paul, not admin. But if he didn't choose account filter, the bug was, or the report was still looking for the account filter, even though the parameters didn't say to look for it. So now it does filter correctly. And the filters in here are now alphabetical. Before they were a little bit like case sensitivity and they weren't truly alphabetical. And it kind of looked like the last one created was the first one listed. So those are now corrected as well. And then there was that hot fix, which prompted the email from Michelle regarding budget adjustments. Um, the adjustment date is normally set to the current date. So when the current date on the physical calendar was outside the fiscal year, when the user was making the adjustment on the account, it was flipping to initial and setting that date as 7-1. And even when the user tried to change it, it would still revert back to the beginning of the next year. So that's been corrected and you can now make an adjustment on the account as long as the current period is in the same fiscal year as the adjustment date. So the current period, for, for example, if you're gonna make a June adjustment, June must be open and current so that the fiscal year is current and then they can make that adjustment date. So the current period in the same fiscal year is the adjustment date and you won't get an error. Any questions on that? Another thing that was worked on was more specific to a district who was unable to generate the spending plan reports. However, during this process of looking at the problem, the developers were able to refactor the encumbrance calculations to perform better for everybody. So that's been improved as well. And then the, a new feature was a new metrics endpoint was added. And I think that endpoint connects to and exchanges information with the computer network but that's to the extent of my understanding. But let us know if you have any questions on that and we'll, we'll get the answers for you. And then we had two patches. These were for specific districts, so they weren't like bugs for everyone, but one was a patch to correct encumbrances related to migration. And the other specific district was to remove a requisition approval workflow that got stuck 
we're out of sync between the two databases, USAS and workflows, when they weren't restored together and they weren't able, the district wasn't able to even delete the requisition. So those two patches were implemented. Any questions on USAS? Okay. Um, next, we're going to go to Lori and she'll review the USPS releases for the month of July. Have a good weekend. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen okay. Set up here quickly. All right. The chat open. Okay. Um, on the payroll side of things, um, we did have um, two regular releases and then a hot fix that went out. Um, it we started out the month with a hot fix, um, and that was to correct um, an issue with orphan positions being included in a in a payroll. Um, so basically, we had re a couple other reports of this, and we were never able to track it down. Um, and then finally, some very um, specific steps that were taken um, were provided in the ticket that came in, and that kind of um, turned on a light bulb for um, our developers, and um, they were able to track down the issue. So basically, this is only happening, or what's happening is, um, say a special pay was um, initialized for maybe one or a couple people. Um, within that payroll, then empty position payments were getting included. Um, they were also being flagged as errors on the pay air report. Um, and we really couldn't track down how this was happening, as I mentioned. So um, the, the key point to this was it was only happening when the delete option was used when um, districts were modifying a payroll um, and then you know deleting those um, pay groups from that the, the grid itself. Um, that was kind of you know what was causing all the, the issues um, that were happening. So that has been fixed. Hopefully that um, won't be won't happen in the future. Again, for those um, of you that experience this, you know, sorry for all the extra work it caused because we did have to kind of, you know, avoid those payments and, and take some extra steps. But hopefully going forward, that has been um, rectified and, you know, districts won't have that problem anymore. The next um, bug um, that was um, now no longer a bug is when importing the new payment with a type of retro, um, if contract workdays were provided in the import file, the value was actually not being carried forward um, into that new contract when it was created. So that has been corrected um, when using the retro payment type or retro type of new contract, those workdays, contract workdays will be populated um, as expected on within the new contract. And then lastly, when it comes to bug fixes, um, the earnings register report, um, it was actually um, listing multiple um, payments um, for the same payment um, when it came to refund payments and multiple transactions were um, applied within that refund. So um, we had reports of districts seeing, you know, a refund listed twice on the report which obviously is called, cause, would cause balancing issues. Um, and the developers were able to track that down, um, figure out what the issue was. And they, you should no longer see then those um, refund payments on the earnings register listed multiple times. When it comes to um, improvements, um, we did have several improvements um, on these you know, last two releases. Um, one is actually um, searching for um, a compensation um, when um, you're looking for when, in new contract when you're looking for 
um, to carry forward or copy that import that new contract. So if no label was entered um, on that existing compensation and the import option of new contract was used, there's a whole series and I've listed those um, below that the system went th goes through to actually find the active compensation to, to carry all those values forward and copy. So it was including archived compensation in its search and that will no longer happen. So I'm not gonna go through step by step, but I thought it is important for you to sort of, you know, understand the process that it's the system is looking at when it goes out and it searches for active compensations. So I've provided that um, in this, underneath this um, improvement bullet. Next, um, when docking an employee, um, there were reports of the amount earned being um, incorrect. And we tracked this down to um, districts turning on and off that stretch pay checkbox. Um, so really, um, whether that box is unchecked or checked, um, you know, the calculation should be the same. Um, so now no matter, you know, how that box is marked and an employee is docked, I've outlined, you know, what the system will, will do. The amount earned should remain the same. The amount paid will be increased by their pay per period minus the dock amount. The dock amount field gets increased by the actual dock amount itself. And then the accrued wages will get decreased um, by that per pay amount. So um, again, a scroll so you guys can see this at the top of the screen instead of the bottom. Um, you know, those are the steps then that the system should perform to update, you know, each, every compensation, no matter how that stretch pay checkbox is marked. Um, next. Um, there were some EMIS reporting changes that were included um, in the 6.97 release. Um, unfortunately, these were included um, a little too soon. Um, we really needed to get through the um, final staff um, reporting, um, and then these changes should be implemented for next fiscal year. Um, so there was a hot fix that went out um, on Tuesday. Um, you should have received a, a message from Matt Combs announcing the hot fix. Um, and basically that reverted, reversed those changes that were um, released a little too soon when it, when it comes to EMIS changes. Um, again, we apologize because I know that this, you know, has caused some trouble and heartache and um, kind of stress for districts because, you know, uh, the deadline is today. Um, so we apologize for any inconvenience that that did cause. Does anybody have any questions with the deadline being today? Um, are districts okay? Do you have any questions when it comes to those changes? Um, I know that we had a couple questions come through yesterday. Um, and just be aware that, you know, with these changes, um, funding source code J and X, those were actually cleared. Um, so if districts needed to re need to report any information with funding source J or X, um, they will have to manually update those few um, uh, positions that that applies to. Um, our understanding when reaching out to ODE is, is that those codes um, should no longer be used anymore. So it should have really been a rare case um, as it as it is. Um, but we did have a district yesterday or an ITC reach out about a district that is still using that funding source. We did ask them to you know reach out to ODE for for guidance because they're, you know, the, the direction we were given from ODE is those really shouldn't be used anymore. 
So again, um, that was all in the release notes as well. So, um, you know, if you have any questions about that, um, you know, please feel free to reference um, the um, release notes as well. Great question, Rhonda. So we're actually going to um, hold off until the very end of August with those changes or the very, very beginning of September. Um, because, yes, we do understand that that needs to, um, you know, those release, those changes need to um, not be implemented until that window is totally closed. So thank you for that question. All right. Um, when it comes to um, employee onboarding, um, we did make an update to that as well um, to allow the edit components um, to work as expected when um, using the custom field type created date time. So those should work um, as expected when it comes to employee onboarding. And then lastly, when it comes to the improvements, um, Box 12 um, really should not, um, on an employee's W-2, those values should never be a negative. Um, we were ch checking for most of those, um, you know, box 12 um, cases. We weren't checking for all of them. So um, this update was um, made to now check for all types um, that could be, you know, uh, printed in box 12, and the system will no longer allow a negative value um, in any of those cases. So, gosh, it's kind of crazy to think that it's W-2 time, but I know our developers, um, when we had our sprint meeting this week, you know, they're very busy working on W-2 changes and, and those sorts of things. It just blows my mind that it's <laughs> that time already. I feel like we just wrapped up W-2s. Um, anyway, moving right along, um, with we did have a couple um, new features, and um, one being the leave activity report. Um, we now have the leave activity date um, right on those um, absence um, records um, and attendance records. So I'm going to show you here. I just got locked out. What I'm talking about. Hopefully, this clears up um, some confusion with the the leave activity report itself. Um, by you, you know, being able to see this date now. So think of the leave activity date is as when did this record affect the employee's balance? So if you're not using deferred um, absence posting, then, you know, when this record is posted, it immediately affects the balance. So I can see here by now this date being you know, actually visible on the record that when I posted this, so think of this as the date entered um, yesterday on August 3rd, I entered this with an activity date or of the 15th. This employee took off, was absent for sick, you know, a sick day on August 15th. However, their balance was affected on August 3rd. OK, if if the district is not using the deferred absence um, posting option. When it comes to attendance, um, you know, the date that the leave activity date will be the date that the activity. These these two dates will match. So the date I entered will be um, or the I'm sorry, the activity date will match the leave activity date. So if I enter you know, something for the 15th, then this leave, leave activity date is going to be the 15th as well. Attendance is a little different. So what's nice about that new leave activity report is if some, if a district, you know, has questions about an employee's balance, what I've done um, is, you know, go to their payments, you know, first run the report, sorry, run the report, you know, for the date range that that's in question. 
and then go to the employee's payments and you should be able to match up exactly what's listed as you know their start with a total the, a, a balance um, the sick leave used or the the leave type in question used if there was anything accumulated and then you know the new balance you should be able to match this value up with any attendance record. And it's helpful because those dates, or I'm sorry, those entries do have pay dates stamped on them. So I, you know, in this case here, let me scroll over. I should be able to find two absence days for personal leave on the May 28th, 2001 payment. If I don't, but it's reflected on their payment, then we know that this entry, you know, an absence entry got deleted. At some point that changed. The leave activity report should also not reflect that absence day. So if something is deleted from, you know, the, the attendance grid, it will not be reflected on the leave activity report either. But the payment itself still shows that that's what printed on the employee's check at the time they were paid. Okay. Yes. The applied to balance um, box is checked as well. Thank you. Yep. So just, you know, a little help um, when it comes to the report itself, um, when it comes to balancing, you know, using the report to balance you know, somebody's leave. Um, we all know it's, you know, that kind of time of year. Um, everybody's, you know, kind of wrapping up things for last fiscal year and they might be needing some resources to, to help balance somebody's um, leave. And that report is super helpful. We just have to understand, you know, how it's working and um, kind of the lingo, so to speak. So the leave activity report, or I'm sorry, the leave activity date is the date the entry was entered, which if it's, you know, if the district is not using the deferred posting option when it comes to absences, it affects the employee's balance at the time that entry was entered. So um, just keep that in mind. And then lastly, um, is the ability to generate uh, an earnings register in CSV format. I know that districts have been asking for this for quite some time. Um, it's, you know, as we all know, this report is a, is a monster. So there is so much information in this report. So our developers, um, needed basically, you know, some help in knowing how the report in CSV format needed to work, how users were wanting, you know, to use it. Um, and so they, um, reached out, Mark Davis sent out a message um, to try to form a, a focus group. Um, and so that focus group basically, you know, met um, several times and they actually, um, you know, put together a plan for what they felt was um, the best um, format for that CSV um, report when it comes to the earnings register. So just to show you, I'm sure you're all aware of it, but if I go to the employee earnings register, you can now see a new option that says generate earnings register by payroll account CSV. Um, you know, again, you can you can choose for specific employees. You can um, choose this by pay group, all the, the normal options that you already had in um, just the regular earnings register are still available when it comes to the CSV option as well. So I've generated this. You can see um, for um, you know, a specific time frame and um, for a specific employee. And I've generated that so that you could see then what this report looks like. So basically, um, when the um, focus group met, they basically wanted to see this broken down by pay account. So every pay account that was charged um, within that payroll you'll see listed under um, the pay account column. And then many values you're gonna see um, repeat. So, you know, the, the obviously the pay date, the payment number, um, you know, the position number um, that this applied to, the gross, 
and so forth. And then on the right hand side, you're going to see all the deductions. Okay. So basically think of this as, you know, broken down by, by pay, pay account. All right. Are there any questions when it comes to any um, of the new features, the, the couple new features that we talked about? All right, then last is just some patches um, that were um, created along with the releases. You should have gotten, you know, notification of those as the releases in the release notes and as the releases went out. So we don't need to go through those in any, any detail, but I did want to um, point those out as well. Just a couple notes. We kind of already talked about one. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but just wanted to point out that the deadline for um, the final staff course collection L um, that is that ends today. Um, so August 4th, as well as the STRS annual report um, that's due um, today as well. So kind of a, you know, a lot going on in the district world for um, a couple of very important reporting um, processes. Okay, the chat one more time. Does anybody have any questions at all before I turn it over to Amanda to talk about inventory? Okay, seeing none, I will stop sharing here and turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Okay, thank you, Lori. All right, well, um, good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk about the inventory items that we have today. Um, we did have two releases in July for inventory, 1.38 and 1.39, uh, right there, speaking in at the very end of the month. Um, let me toggle one thing here, hang on. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so um, actually everything that we have on the inventory list today falls under bug fixes. These were all bug issues that we worked. Um, so I have some notes on each one for you. Um, we'll kind of go through here. The first one is the fixed assets by source report was causing the report bundle, bundle to fail. And what we found is that um, this was happening if there were null account codes. Um, so that fixed assets by source, uh, fixed asset by source report, uh, that's the one because it's showing the source, right? So it's showing like where that, like the original like purchase information essentially, that's how I think about it. Um, so this means it's uh, coming from the acquisition, right? So that acquisition has the full account code on it. Um, now, there was only a specific situation where these could be null. I believe this was only if they were imported from Classic and they had a null. Um, you can put all zeros in there when you create them, but we were running into this. And so we had, you know, multiple reports where this was causing an issue. So what we did is we just went ahead and fixed the report. So if you do run into that, they don't have to go worry about fixing any like old acquisitions. It would just be the report could just handle it and go forward um, from here. The next one is the username field. So the username field um, has been updated. So uh, from your very main page, when they go to log in, um, we found that if you did like the reset password on that main page, the username field was grayed out, which was actually a function we had put in there for like, the page for the user page within the software that had kind of carried over to this pop-up. And so that was causing it where they their username wasn't in there. They couldn't type a username in there to reset. So that is fixed now. Um, when they open it, you can see on this screenshot here. Let's see. Zoom in a little bit more so we can see our screenshot. So um, 
the username field here, I have test user in there. When they open that up, that would be blank. And they type in their username and then their old password and their new password. You're welcome, Rhonda. I know I know that was a tough one with the timing too, because uh, I think we found it out when uh, the, the you know password expiration, if that's something where they got set up at the same time, um, but good to go going forward. The next one here, I'm gonna zoom back out a tad. <laughs> um, the creation of the fiscal year has been improved to check the migration year and allow creating subsequent um, fiscal years. So what, what I wanna talk about with this one is when they import uh, what, or when they migrated, the fiscal year, the first fiscal, well, the fiscal year um, that they're coming over in, it creates just the one fiscal year, right? So like if they had EIS history, like if they had previous years um, at migration time, it didn't go back and create uh, years prior to that. So what, what we've done is we've put some rules in place to make sure that they don't, they can't like accidentally go back and just be like recreating old years past um, what they came over with. Now, the problem that we ran into is we um, had a couple of districts that migrated and like their current year was actually like 2020. So in order to catch up, uh, this this rule that was intended not to have them go back before was actually preventing that. So so basically what this allows is that now it checks their migration year so they can create any years that are after that migration year, after um, whatever they migrated at, which is just the logical um, progression of that. So, um, so yes. The next one is um, kind of similar to the first one that we talked about is for the user listing report. So we had a couple reports of this bug where um, if a user didn't have a role assigned, it wasn't working. Um, and so now like uh, basically the report will work regardless. So, um, so that's set to go. And then this next one is, uh, so the item UI has been updated to properly handle depreciation dates. Um, this one I want to talk about, we uh, have talked about this before on a recap because um, previous, so basically what we did is we had added um, a, an error. Originally it was an error that we added so that the depreciation begin date was um, before the acquisition date. So uh, basically when this was happening, so this shouldn't be something that they can add a new item if the depreciation date is before that acquisition date. Um, but what we found is once we put in this rule, which makes complete sense for new items, um, if, if then they were to try and edit an item and uh, it came over, like it, either it was created prior to this rule being in place or uh, we're, we were seeing it with a lot of the imported transactions, if they try and edit one that has incorrect dates, then it was flagging and they couldn't edit like another field because it was also checking for this. So. What the software does now is if they're editing an item that's in this situation, depreciation date before acquisition date, um, it'll show a warning. So it'll still flag this because it's still something that should be recognized, but it's just a warning so they can still go ahead and save whatever update they're making. So if they're changing something else on that item, that is not, you know, that's not even related to these dates, they still want to be able to do that. Um, and then if they're adding a new item, an error will display, meaning that they'll go ahead and update their dates. Uh, they can't proceed past that uh, to actually make the new item so that they'll be correct. And then um, we also updated the importer as well to be consistent with those. Okay, Ooh, my scroll's over here. All right, uh, the next one is a book value report. Uh, this one's interesting. It was listed as a bug, but um, you know, it, it does make a it does make a good uh, update to this report, I would say. So the book value report um, was updated to include the item category. Oops, sorry, item category uh, when you sort by it. 
So this book value report has a lot of information on it. Um, and that's one of the difficult parts, right? Because there's a lot of different things they might want to see. But even if we just look at this screenshot real quick, like you can see how many columns are already on here. So what this does is when you go to generate the report, uh, this last option here is the select sort options. So if they select item category, previously it was not showing it anywhere like it, you could pick uh, as a sort but it wouldn't actually like show uh so what this looks like now is see the header here and then the total so um it's been up updated so that it actually includes to show that information um when that's um chosen as a sort And then last, we refactored the capitalization criteria um, to properly um, calculate capitalization for leased items. So nothing really to show on that one, but we've got it on there. Okay. And that's all I got for inventory. Any questions on inventory? Okay, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap us up here. I'm going to hop over to our um, trainings page. And actually, let me let me start from the beginning so you can see where I'm at, just in case. So I'm going to the meetings and trainings and our ITC training and registration up here. Okay, so a little bit of scroll to get us to August. A little bit. Look how far we are into the year. This is wild. Where is it going? Okay. So here we are at the July re uh, recap. Next week, we have um, a USPS training for the new fiscal year initial L reporting for EMIS reporting. Um, and then later in August, we'll have uh, report generation, best practices as well. And um, August recap, but then September we're off to Oedza. So yeah, this year is moving right along. Um, and we hope to see you at our future trainings and maybe even at Oedza. Um, but yeah, so that is all we have for you today. And um, I hope everyone has a good weekend. I love to hear that it's chocolate chip cookie day. So hopefully everyone uh, can get some cookies in. <laughs> have a good one. <laughs>